Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our show, To Whom It May Concern. I'm your host, Malak, here with my co-hosts, Inara, Khoyla, and Maria. Hey, Salaam Alaikum. Salam. For anyone that's typically on social media, or anyone that follows any of the news outlets, you should at least know that there's something going on with the country of Sudan. And it's important for us to be concerned with the politics in other countries, because not only are these politicians and countries and governments that are involved, but a lot of it falls typically on the citizens of that country, and they're the ones that suffer the most at the hands of the government. So we decided that it's really important to kind of dive into what's going on in Sudan and break it down so that we all kind of have a basis of what's honestly going on in the country. So what do you ladies think? I think it's important for us to be involved in what's going on around the world and for us to just be like more aware and then for us to not just be so caught up in our lo- personal lives and what's going on here at home. Yeah, I think it's so easy for us to kind of overlook what's happening around the world and the crises that people are experiencing. And it seems like today, on social media especially, that we see that a lot people are really stepping up today. They're not mm-hmm. accepting anymore what their governments are doing for them. If they don't feel like they're treated as basic humans, they're not giving those basic necessities, they're really stepping up and they're making a difference. And even if you go on social media or you go on the news outlets, a lot of times the people that are at the forefront are the youth. So it's mm-hmm. it's like young people, you know, like... Young, older teenagers, young 20s, you know, mid-20s, they're the mm-hmm. ones that are really vocalizing that if they don't like something, they're going to make a change happen. And it spreads like wildfire through the social media. And it's really interesting because I feel like America's education system in general isn't built to teach our students about, you know, the world and geography and mm-hmm. just in basic world history. So the fact that you see that change happening because of social media, that people are starting mm-hmm. to realize what's happening across the world, it, it's astonishing. I think what's happening in Sudan and what really got the news out there, like we've mentioned, was through social media. So if you noticed a lot of news outlets and, you know, the TV wasn't capturing it until it kind of spread on social media, people started changing their screens into like blue icons. And so once that spread, it kind of forced them to talk the about news it. to like so, notice. Because yeah. I noticed, so I follow like Stay Tuned on Snapchat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And literally, you know, I like it's like a really quick news as to what's going on. And they didn't cover it the day of as to like what was happening. They didn't do it till like a week later. And then they then they started mentioning about what's happening in Sudan. And so I'm not sure until like people were talking about and it. And I'm sure that's after a lot of the celebrities were also posting mm-hmm. about it. And you can tell that they're like the news is really behind on it kind of because this has been going on like we'll talk about later in the episode but this has been going on for months like in itself Mm -hmm. this specific crisis has been going on for months it's not something that started a week ago Mm -hmm. but up until like a week or a week and a half ago you didn't like i personally didn't know anything that was good i didn't even know sudan was like had a crisis until it really started to pick up among the younger people Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. then i saw all these posts and i was like oh maybe i should kind of read about it and learn about it which is pretty disappointing because it seems like what the opposite is supposed to be happening like we're supposed to be getting our news from these news outlets as opposed to them looking at what's a hot topic between us and then choosing to write a story about it yeah that's yeah i mean it is that's true it is disappointing and that's why i think it's important for us to discuss these topics because it's just like we whoever the listeners that we can reach and kind of allow you or help you to understand what's going on in Sudan is really helpful and it's a great outreach. All right, well, let's get right into it. Like Manak mentioned earlier, it is important to note the history of Sudan. Unshockingly, the British colonized it in 1898 and they governed it kind of differently between the north of Sudan and the south of Sudan, primarily pulling its resources into the north. So this happened up until 1956, where Sudan won self-determination. Which isn't that crazy? Like, 1956 isn't that long ago. So that's almost 100 years of colonization. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it like that, relatively speaking, Sudan's like a baby country. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it hasn't been around long enough that it's not even as much of a surprise that they have so many problems. You know, like, I feel like they haven't had enough time yet to actually establish, kind of. And I mean, I, I just think it's problematic to know that even though they haven't been established for a long time, yet you have... Um, Omar al-Bashir, who has been ruling it for 30 years as a dictator, yeah. like to know that that's how even it but started off him trying to... But that's a thing. I mean, usually that's half the it's recurrent. amount of time the country's been around. Yeah, but not just that. Like, usually they get colonized and then they have no foundation for a good government to govern its people. Yeah, and then they, like, all the resources are taken, the people are used to being governed by a different mm-hmm. country. And then when, the, when Britain pulls out, they, ha- they leave nothing there. If anything, they try to put some p- sort of puppet regime so that they can sort of still have that control. 
So this doesn't come off to you guys as much of a surprise. Not at all. It's a, I think it's a pattern it's, that we've seen a lot, especially in the Arab countries during yeah. the Arab Spring. Mm-hmm. There's Whoever, a dictator, they mm-hmm. throw it up over, and then it's kind of like complete chaos. Everybody wants to rule. Nobody knows how to rule. And There's the like, the really average human suffers. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. the middle class suffers right, and the billions. poverty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, moving forward in Sudan's history, um, after 1956, after they won self-determination, there was still a lot of chaos between the North and the South. There were so many civil wars all the way up until 2005 when they said, decided to sign um, a peace deal between the two So because a lot of people ended up dying in, in that time. So peace deal, as in that's when they officially separated into their own country. No, that didn't happen until 2011 when South Sudan, which is its own country, by the way, you guys, <laughs> um, seceded. In 2005, okay. it was more like a peace treaty between the two sides mm. that allowed um, South Sudan to govern itself, where in 2011, they had an official vote and they and had they the opportunity to okay. secede, which they did. Yeah, I remember a while back when South Sudan seceded at that time, but I didn't really look into it at that point. I just like looked up a few facts. And that's and pretty moved recent. On. Twenty, you know, two thousand eleven. I mean, in two thousand and eleven. That's like eight years ago. A whole new country was starting and developing, and South Sudan has you know its own issues right now. But that's not what we're focusing on right now. We're focusing on Sudan. Okay, so after two thousand and eleven, fast forwarding to what is the issue that's happening now? Recently, in April two thousand nineteen. Al-Bashir, who was the dictator, like we mentioned earlier, for over 30 years, was actually bought down by army takeover um, in the middle of pro-democracy uprisings in the country. So he was overthrown, but it originally started by... The uh, protesters. Right, like an, they had economic issues, so like gas prices were going up, food um, prices, and I think they had even food shorter, shortages. Yeah, so the Sudanese Professional Association which at the SPA is actually the people who originally started uh, call for these uprisings and they were they actually were doctors and local unions that banded together that called for a democracy. So why do you should feel proud look at what you guys <laughs> your doctors are doing <laughs> oh yeah around the world. So what the issue is right now is that after Al Bashir you know, went out of office to replace him was a transitional military council that said they were going to remain in power for at least two years. And the people didn't like this. So they decided that they were going to continue to protest in the capital of Sudan. Yeah, and military, people from the military decided that they were going to go and clear these protest areas and they used violence, which is what we're at today and what all the social media topics are right now. And their original protests were nonviolent protests. They were like sit-ins. Yeah, so the people never had violent protests. It was uh, they were met with violence, though. That's not surprising either. It's always that the government takes a more aggressive stance when it comes to like the people because they feel threatened. Exactly. Even though it's just words and just. I mean, I guess it has a bigger effect than if they were to be violent. But wait, so I mean, before that, we had the civilians and the military talking over. So once the, um, Al Bashir stepped down, stepped down, and he was arrested. You had them having conversations, but as soon as it didn't go the way that they wanted, the military, the military, and there was a disagreement. That's when they decided to kind of like use more of a forceful force. They took over the government and started executing and, and now killing people. people. Yeah, people are getting killed. Women are being raped. Kids are mm-hmm. being taken away from families. Like it's, it's just disgusting. Yeah, they found it's, it's chaotic. It's all it's. Pure Pure chaos. Like nobody knows what's going on. There's no the sense blackouts. Yeah, there's a blackout. Yeah, there's no safety. News outlets aren't allowed really in Sudan. Mm-hmm. Like, and mm-hmm. the military is doing that purposely, obviously, so that they, can they don't see so people. It. Right, so people, so they don't have access to other countries to seek help and to like, mm-hmm. you know, or to even report Downplay what's going it, on. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know why it always shocks me when I see that governments turn on their own people. You it's know, not even like, the government, it's the army. And But it's like, you're... It's yeah, like, let's and the purpose of the army that's supposed to, yeah, protect exa- you. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what and you're it's for. Not, it's not even about their role as the army. It's more the role of, like, you're civilians just like the people. You know, like, mm-hmm. if you're destructing your country and you guys are going to through all this turmoil and there's nothing left of Sudan after this gets resolved, like, what was the point of it? You know, like, mm-hmm. these are people that your neighbors, your friends, your families, like, I don't know, it just... I just never understand how people are okay with it. I just never understand when people go against their own people with violence, you know? Mm-hmm. I just It's different when an outside party comes and tries to terrorize, but like when the own country is killing their own killing people. Killing their own people and they're just destroying each other from the inside out. It's 
it's ridiculous. The, the military itself want so what they want is obviously like a, they want a democratic country where the, the, the civilians people, have yeah the people want that. But did the military originally agree to that or were they supportive of Al Bashir? No, they didn't support Al Bashir, but they wanted to take control of the government for a couple years until the country can quote unquote get up on its feet and then like start a democratic system. But of course, the people probably didn't have trust in that. In that they'd well, stay the for people, a couple of years and then. Wait, the people what's going into this council aren't great people. So if we look at there's the general Abdul Fatihi Burhan who's on the council. His second in command, Muhammad Hamdan Dagalo, which Hamadi is like what people know him as. He's the second in command and he oversaw the genocide in Darfur. And he's the one who went to Saudi Arabia and is getting millions of dollars in support from Saudi Arabia in order to keep on doing these military raids because he's the one who well, according to multiple sources, he's the one who sat the army to do violence against these protesters. So yeah, they didn't trust in the people in charge of the army. So why would they think, oh, they're only going to be here for two years? They'll probably just start another sort of um, dictatorship. And it's surprising to see who's really at the forefront of this crisis. It's really the women and the youth. Um, for Sudan in general, there's 63% of their population is under the age of 25 and 43% are under the age of 15. So, I mean, almost half of the population has More than half. Yeah, hasn't even... But I'm saying, like, the 43%, oh. they haven't even reached adolescence yet. Like, these are actual children. They're babies. Exactly. These are children that are speaking up. And I think it's because we're raised in a time where you're no longer just accepting of everything that comes our way. People are actually... And it's not... Clearly, it's not just in the United States of America, but people are really feeling empowered and they're no longer feeling like they have to live in fear. They have to live under dictatorship. You mm -hmm. know, it's it's refreshing to see that people are actually taking the reins on their ideas and mm -hmm. they're stepping up and making it happen. But then the other side to that is that these are children, so they're not thinking long term necessarily or the repercussions of their actions. So, like, this isn't the first time a country is going under revolution, right? Mm -hmm. There's other countries like Egypt, like Syria, like Libya. And those countries till now have yet to have any, like, end in sight. You know what I mean? It's just war and killing and violence. So it's like... It poses the question, is it better to kind of live just under the dictatorship kind of silently or mm -hmm. to stand up, make a difference, and suffer for years? Yeah, without, like, any end in sight. But is there ever a change that happens without war? You know what I mean? Like, no. doesn't that need to exist? Like, even America itself, like, we, to end slavery, but you when, had the civil war. But when you're looking at countries like Syria, like, that's not war. That's destruction. That's... Well, like, it is death war. Tolls, like, but that's death tolls that you've never seen. Like, that's history, hundreds of years mm -hmm. of history that can never be brought back. Like, it's not just the idea. It's not just the concept of war. It's everything that comes with it. Right. My thing is, yeah, usually no one's ever going to give you your rights, so you have to fight for it. Mm -hmm. And every group that, that is being persecuted needs to fight for their freedom. The thing is, the cost? timing. No, also the timing of when you decide to fight for it. Like, are you prepared and are you willing to... Is there an ever a good time? I was going to say, I don't think there's ever a time where you can be like, okay, now. Well, at least... Like, he stepped no. down, and they thought, like, okay, like, he stepped down, well, he, and now we're having talks, and then the military takes over, and then well, this what, happens. So then, so they were celebrating. There was a time where they were they, dancing. There were finally the books that they used to stay, but like, But that's we're exactly not it. They shouldn't have ever started dancing. They should have... No, again, but it was a big victory for them to overthrow their dictator. So here's the thing. If once they overthrew the dictator, they should have had someone right away step up. Like, then what? They should have had a, a backup plan right away so to prevent anyone from sneaking into position like the people people in the army who are now taking control. So yeah, some, sort of, some, sort of long some sort of long-term plan where it's like, okay, he stepped down. All of a sudden, there needs to be a leader right mm -hmm. away. Like, you need to step up. You need to take control. Start a, some sort of democracy, like, s right away. And especially, like, after seeing all of these people and all these other countries, we, like, we need to learn from other people's mistakes. And like, I think it, it's hard to do that because the country itself is divided. You have your, the military that wants a certain way and mm -hmm. people that are for that. And then you have your people who want democracy. Exactly. So, and I think people are really just concerned at the moment with getting out of, like, getting out of harm's way at that moment. But that's so exactly it. That that's, that's, that's suffering for 30 years, though. But that's exactly it. Like, if you don't think about the long term, you're going to continue to suffer now for the next 30 years. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, I could see what you're saying. It's 
if it's executed better or if there's a, a we, backup plan maybe then they they don't have to suffer as much again, as they are now it's so much easier said, said than, than done, done. Well, i completely understand and we that. technically don't know that we don't know that they weren't planning ahead or like meeting and trying to fix things or or like you they know had somebody in mind i don't know maybe. i just it's like when i look at all these countries all these muslim con- arab countries that are like one after the other like it was and we all got excited especially with the whole arab spring and now it's like what did we get after that you know mm-hmm. there's still people suffering there's still people dying there's millions of refu- refugees there's like the complete like the countries are basically Budget. collapsed mm-hmm. yeah i mean you're bound to see dark times and struggle after something like that mm-hmm. just because not mm-hmm. even let's just say they executed and they had a good idea just that whole like this is a dynamic change for a country they're no mm-hmm. longer under the rule of one person let's say now they develop governments they have heads they have division or mm-hmm. they have parliaments or something you know but it's a whole dynamic change for a country so it's not even simply who's gonna run the country it's more like how do i begin to run the country mm-hmm. but that's what i'm saying like this should be planned out before you even start protesting and taking down that dictator i don't think they knew it was going to go get this far but that's I, originally like, it was like an economic crisis and that's why they were protesting but and it exactly led to the, um, i guess that's what i'm trying to say like that's also the downfall of these being all young people leading it like yeah. they don't i don't know if they had the vision I don't, or the experience and the wisdom to like look that far ahead right but that's the thing you need that kind of leadership well there's also a whole nother dynamic coming into play here so when we see that when you have a one common enemy the dictator that they all want to take down they all bond together and they got him to come down right mm-hmm. but now they all have different interests which they're fighting against each other is what we're seeing mm-hmm. so it's easier to band together when you have a common enemy and i think like uh, when I listed those statistics at 63% and the 43%, it's also a lot of things that we don't think about is these people may be at the forefront of the fight, but when it, when it comes down to it, more than half the population can't even vote. You or know like what I'm the saying? The decision so making? The, so the people that actually put in the hard work and the effort can't even really get a say in what's going on anyways. Then it falls on the hands of the older people, mm-hmm. and they're kind of like, well, maybe they're thinking like, well, we didn't really... We weren't well, up for this, you know, like. Mm-hmm. But that's what I was saying. So, like, if it was still the dictator still in position, and then they're like, okay, you know, our plan is going to be he's going to take charge or, like, for the interim or whatever until we have this, and then this is going to be the democracy, one, two, three. Like, they have that sort of outline at least so that when he does come down, you can just kind of, everyone's going to be in agreement to it. I don't know. Again, I've never been in a revolution, though, so... Well, I would think that even if they do have some type of strategy into place, the people that are taking power are yeah. the people that have the weaponry to the back military, them. The military, yeah. So it's not as if the people, the protesters, they might be the masses, they have the numbers, but in actuality, they don't have the weaponry. Mm-hmm. So you see that they can protest all they want, exactly. but if the military decides to go against them, that's why it takes international... Kind of an international stance that needs to be taken against Sudan. Like, if you look at what the UN is doing right now, it's kind of pathetic. They're having a meeting about it. Like, people are dying, and you're having a meeting. You're not even going to go and try and condemn them for what they're doing. Right, they have to go see what's going on and what's happening. The UN is pointless. Yeah, I was going to say, the United Nations has never really offered aid in any of these situations that we've seen in history. They're more of a, oh, we're sitting there and we're going to get to it, but I don't... No, or if anything, they'll offer money and aid, but it's not, like, actually solving the the problem. The real struggle with the UN right now in terms of what we're seeing is that China and Russia are actually backing what's happening in Sudan right now and the interim government. So, and who takes a heavy part in the UN voting? Oh, no surprise, China and Russia. So they're blocking any type of Mm -hmm. real progress that the UN can do. So, I mean, we're not going into a discussion about how the UN is just a messed up system in general, Mm -hmm. but that's what's happening. So China and Russia are blocking any, you know, UN real type of... Action. Yeah, of action. But then we also have, you know, Europe kind of funding the generals now to keep refugees in Africa because <laughs> we have this kind of influx, influx of refugees trying to go through Sudan and end up in Europe, right, mm-hmm. from like Ethiopia and other countries. So what Europe is doing is giving aid to Sudan to keep the refugees there instead of keep sending them. So it, the international sphere, Sudan is getting a lot of money and support from them, and that's kind of the issue. Mm-hmm. And I think 
when we like how we said earlier it's easier when the whole country is fighting against the common enemy and for all we know there was agreement about what was going to happen next but you know now you have the military with the weapons pointing at the people that wanted the power you know and then like, so many other different players i'm sure are exactly getting involved. it's mm-hmm. it's a power struggle and you have the innocent people that thought they were fighting for democracy yeah. and they have guns pointed at them and they're like they're just doing co- like quiet protests and they're just there's no violence on their end but they have all these weapons and these killings and these murders happening and it's kind of like they don't know what to do anymore they're mm, know. they can't trust anybody from either side so we always think of it as such an innocent and pure idea the the interest of democracy and the people mm-hmm. and then we forget to look at the power plays happening so for example, Sudan has access to the Red Sea, which is one tenth of the world's oil is shipped. So it's there have ge- like geographically a good place to be in and mm-hmm. hold political power where other countries are interested in them being stable in the sense where they just want someone that they can use as a puppet in a sense. Exactly. Or they can pay off in order to get what they want. And we forget these these plays when it comes to such an innocent idea of democracy. Mm-hmm. We forget about money, we forget about power, we forget about what's happening in, in general. Exactly. And then those are the factors that have other countries getting involved there and kind of trying to manipulate the situation that in a way that benefits them. And I don't know how realistic this idea is, but I just think that when you're put in a situation like this, the most ideal thing is to go 50-50. Like, mm-hmm. they have their Lieutenant General Abdel Fattah Abdurrahman Burhan, who's been in charge for the military council. You know, he's the one that's been taking over the country since the arrest of the dictator. Like, the least you can do in order to keep things calm and to keep the country moving is to take one or two civilian representatives and just include them in the process. You know, like... I agree. Just to allow the people to know that, yes, you have representation, that's all it really takes. Especially when you take a group of people that have been under dictatorship for so long. Any kind of representation is something. You know, that's progressive in itself i agree but a lot of times people are kind of like all or nothing so like the military is like no i'm gonna take all mm-hmm. control and then the people are like no i want like a full democracy 100 percent right away and it's like that's just what keeps the fighting going rather than trying to come to a compromise and be like okay you guys will take control maybe for this long and then we'll start voting and then having like what you said having um these two civilians be our representatives well i think that's what there was like we are gonna For the meantime, we're going to try to figure out Mm -hmm. how to run. Yeah, how should we run? Like, what should be our next play? Mm -hmm. But then the military took force, you know? Like, there was that conversation. But it's always one group wanting more or wanting... They think that what they're going to do is the best or... And that's what leads to our downfall. It's pride. It's ego. It's it's power. It's it's greed. It's hubris. Yeah, it's just nobody wants to share with each other. More oftentimes than not, countries that are led by dictatorship are the countries that don't last the longest. Like, they always end up having some type of revolution or something because nothing should... The responsibility of a whole country should never be put on one person's shoulders. Mm -hmm. It's just not realistic. There's too many aspects to it. Well, people also get fed up. You know what I mean? If I'm, like, starving, there's no, like, money coming mm -hmm. in, like, you just eventually... Which is kind of what we've seen in Sudan. That it is such a rich country and it had, you know, many oil resources they were selling and that there was a part of the country that were super rich when they had a majority of their people were starving. Mm -hmm. So, of course, there's going to be unrest against the government Mm because it doesn't make any sense. And like you said, originally these people were arguing and they were angry, not even solely because of how the country was run. It was because food prices were insanely Mm -hmm. high. Like, cost of living was what they couldn't afford. And it's also like you're burying your own people at the same time. Yeah. You know? It's funny. People People forget that a country is its people. You have no mm-hmm. people. You have no country. You can't be a whole country by yourself. <laughs> they just want the, all the resources for themselves. What can we actually do? Now that we had this conversation, what can we do as a people? I think it's a really, really, really important to stay informed. Like, continue to read up on it, watch it on the news, and spread the word. I think for people that are so far from Sudan, you know, in the U.S., that that's one of the biggest things that we can do is continue to show people mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. we stand with them and we hear them. Right, like bringing awareness... Um, bring awareness by spreading the word like Medic was saying through social media um also donating to like unicef for children that have been displaced their families mm-hmm. that what they're experiencing i don't um a lot of people are struggling to find an actual legit money source to help the people the sudanese people but um i know unicef is doing something for the children um they say call and text your congress let them know what's happening and like pushing that forward letting them to kind of get involved and make a difference yeah you guys there was like a instagram scam actually where someone was like post this and one dollar will be donated to sudan 
but that was actually false. So just check up on your resources on what you're posting and where your money's going. Make sure to check out fake news as well. Check out multiple news sources to get the full truth, just in general. And of course, most importantly, pray for them. Make as much da'a as you can for the people. So it's interesting that like if you go on Twitter and what people are you know are hashtagging, um, hashtagging you know, Sudan massacre and what's happening. And a lot of people are speaking about, about how like, you know, when the Notre Dame Cathedral burnt down, mm, they yeah. uh, like, automatically got news um, sources talking about it and Stupid so much building. money. And here are people's <laughs> lives, you know, being killed and women being raped. And no, yeah. there's no voices. People are. It was a delayed response. Yeah. And, that, and they only responded because of people on social media. It's funny because I was actually in my class one time. Uh, during my class last semester when that happened and when Notre Dame went on fire my white professor spoke about it in class that that same day and then she was like literally almost to tears she then sent an email where she mentioned it something about the Notre Dame and then the next week she also mentioned it again wow three times and then it's funny because the week or a couple weeks before that that's the New Zealand shooting happened and then a couple weeks after that the synagogue was shot up and nothing was mentioned no mention when people's lives were like actually affected and but killed. over a building she mentioned it over three times i was so annoyed That's and so sad it was so i was so disgusted by that i'm like really i think these people like people in power or like professors and stuff like that they don't want to mention certain things because they don't want to make it seem like they're picking a side i don't even think you know she, what i'm saying no it's not no when people are dying i mean i agree it's a humanitarian like just as no, a basic no. human i honestly think she was just very like she had no idea she was just that ignorant oh or like she was so, and the she thing was unmoved is, by it like. yeah and then she'd always mention in class like oh you know the diversity because it's at uic the diversity in this blah 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 and then talk about it but like when it actually comes to really knowing about other people and their struggle completely ignorant and that's sad because that shouldn't be accepted mm-hmm. by a professor at such an esteemed mm-hmm. university but i mean uic did m- send out an email and actually saying something about the new zealand which is really well, nice. So, Zealand, really like, so do it. I see it? The institution <laughs> itself did speak oh, out. Oh yeah, I'm not it. talking about her. I'm, I'm, I'm going to defend the place that I work at. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm not talking about the 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 university. The university. I'm yeah. talking about the, her specifically, right. and especially like the stereotypical white professor. Yeah, I don't know. I think Hoyla, a lot of time why you know your professor probably didn't speak out and a lot of people didn't speak out against it was because the people are black, they're African, they're Muslim. So literally they have yeah. all these things against them that people are don't want to really say much. Or they just relate to people who they identify with or mm. they look like. Branching off all the university talk, I did want to give you guys an update on the Jason Hill and DePaul issue. Since Sidifa isn't here, he's been releasing articles that state that Um, They should disband Students for Justice in Palestine and all BDS initiatives. He's called for physical surveillance by Homeland Security and to check all students' immigration status that are in SJP, which is funny. Um, He also released articles discussing how Islam can never be um, compatible with American values. So these are all super upsetting articles that he's released that are making his students feel endangered and threatened for the rights of freedom and showing a lot of bigotry. And this is happening here at home in Chicago. Yeah, I I honestly think it's pathetic. But I also think it's funny that he's in such a position or he's like at that point where the only thing he can do is try to attack the students. Like, this is the most basic human right you're guaranteed, even especially as an American. That one freedom that we all hold on to is the freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's so funny that he's immediately trying to, it's not even on an intellectual level that he's trying to battle these students. It's Mm -hmm. more like, check their immigration papers. Like, sir, we're born here. These people that are arguing with you are born here. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just a waste of time. I don't know. And those are, but like, that kind of people are the people that, like, if he was the dictator of Sudan, he'd probably be doing the same thing. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's the attitude, and that's, like, the t- sort of... The tone. Yeah, that creates such a hostile environment, and then depending on how powerful you are, it can actually lead to destruction and violence. Yeah, and that's even seen through Trump. Mm-hmm. I mean, him alone, he is the cause of so much phobia and, like, mm-hmm. of so much attacks and ostracizing of not just the Muslim... I mean, especially the Muslim community, but not just Muslims, it's minorities in general. And so hate crimes, and yeah. It's like so. monkey see, monkey do honestly it's just funny to me he's in a position of as an educator as a person who's supposed to have an open mind who's supposed to preach wisdom to his students and knowledge and he's the one who's spewing 
hatred and fear and causing all this unrest. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much to everyone for tuning in and listening to this week's episode of To Whom It May Concern. Please subscribe, like, and follow us on social media. We appreciate all the support you guys give us and all the feedback that we receive. If you don't already follow us, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Modern Skeps. And please continue to tune in every week on Tuesday mornings. If you have any ideas you'd like us to discuss, you know you can find us and DM us on social media. Or you can email us at modernskeptics at gmail.com. Sincerely, the modern skeptics. P.S. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor.